Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to our Sunday afternoon Bible study session for James. Welcome to you all here, and welcome to those of you who are viewing this online. I do hope you enjoy what George has got prepared for us this afternoon. So let's start with some prayer. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for bringing us together this afternoon. Bringing us together to learn more about your word and your will through the writing of James. As we continue to study what it really means to be a true and active disciple who not only hears the words but acts on them to the glory of your name. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for the blessings that you've given us. And we ask all of this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. So we're going to start with our first part of the reading today. And we're looking at James chapter 2. And I'm going to start by reading verses 1 through to 12. So James chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favouritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, here, sit, have a seat here please, while to the one who is poor you say, stand there, or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonoured the poor it is not the rich who oppress you. Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfil the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For the one who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. And if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. So now Maggie's going to bring a second passage to us. Right. James chapter 4, 1 to 6 and verse 10. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask a God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, 
that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know what friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely? But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Well, this afternoon we start on our third uh, study of uh, the letter of James, and we are dealing with the subject of prejudice. And the reading that Marie brought to us from James 2 tells the story of a rich man who came into the place of worship and how he was received, and the poor person who came in and how he was received. And obviously, um, James knew of situations, or at least one situation, where this kind of thing was going on, and he was addressing it in this uh, letter. Because as we will see, looking at this particular section, chapter 2, and also at part of chapter 4, one of the tests of our faith is how we treat other people. Going away back to the Old Testament, to 1 Samuel uh, chapter 16 and verse 7, we have these words, For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And that led me to think, of the story in Luke chapter 18 of the Pharisee and the publican who went up to the temple uh, to pray. And I wonder if we could put ourselves in that position of watching these two people coming into church. There is the Pharisee with all the trimmings and the trappings of status and wealth and maybe even fame or success. And then there was the poor publican sitting at the back who was asking God to be merciful to him. And I wonder what our reaction would be. I guess, if we're honest with ourselves, we probably would have favored the Pharisee and all that he stood for, upright and observing the letter of the law, etc., And maybe we might not have the same heart for the publican. And yet in God's sight, the one who went from church justified was the one who said, Lord, be merciful uh, to me, a sinner. So in this chapter 2 of his uh, letter, James deals with uh, one of the causes of division today in the Christian church because prejudice touches all our lives and consequently the lives of others and the life and witness of the church. The world outside is waiting and watching more than we realize and we need to ask ourselves what do they see? Prejudice rears its ugly head in different ways, and James pinpoints various ways uh, prejudice displays itself. First of all, he puts the finger on discrimination. And of course, it's easy to see this in the light of the particular account that uh, James gave about the rich man and the poor man. And here he is saying, look, 
To discriminate means that you treat others unfairly. He asks those who are his hearers not to discriminate between rich and poor, the haves and the have-nots. Love and serve, he says, rich and poor equally. Accept people as they are in a spirit of humility. Then he says, prejudice can display itself in favoritism. And you know, we all have our favorites. I think it's part of the human lot. And I don't think it's something that we can do an awful lot about because there are some people we, we are naturally drawn to more than others. But although that is true, when it comes to preferential treatment, well, that can cause a problem. In my experience as a vicar over the years, one of the great problems I've had to face as a leader in a church is favoritism. And favoritism that displays itself in the form of cliques. Small, exclusive groups are often a thorn in the flesh, finding favor with others of like mind. And I can tell you now, there is very, very little within a church that can bring about so much division than that kind of favoritism. Then James says there is partiality, a bias towards something, or having a strong dislike of something. Years and years and years ago, when I went to work in a parish, they had an indoor bowls um, a team, and they used to meet every week. So they invited me to come in. And um, so I went in to meet them and that sort of thing. But then they said, would you like to take part? Well, I've never played bowls, you see, at this point in my life, and I didn't know anything about them. And so when I had this bowl in my hand and I threw it down the mat, the bias was in the wrong side. So instead of coming in towards the jack, it went out to all over the hall, much to the amusement of the people there who were more wise about these things than I was. But I thought to myself afterwards, you know, there is in all of us that kind of bias. Bias that often takes us away from those things that are right and good and true. A long time ago, I had a clergyman friend and uh, who would often say, I'm partial to a little drama. Well, you know, I thought about being partial and I thought to myself, yeah, I can see how it works in my life. I can be sitting in a room and someone comes in through the door that I've never met before. And I can say to myself, I don't like the look of him. Immediately making a statement about someone. But it's something that we, we all do. And if we're honest, I think you will... You will say, yes, this strikes a chord. You can look around the church and I can see people that I'm drawn to. And I can see other people that I want to keep at an arm's distance. Then, says James, there is judgmentalism, a critical attitude towards others. And he's laying down the law here and he's saying, look, 
don't judge. Be always ready to show mercy. Realize that no one is capable of judging another. Years ago, I heard a story of a lady who moved into a district, and this happened somewhere between the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. She moved into the district. It was a new district for her. And she wasn't there very long before some of the neighbors began making judgments about her and about her son and the way in which he was dressed when he was going to school. A strange man called at regular intervals, etc. And so it went on. But when the truth really came out, it transpired that the woman was being treated for cancer. The man who called was a doctor who was a friend and part of the family. And the lady uh, struggled with housework. She struggled with getting her son ready uh, for school. And I wonder when the truth of all that came out, how many red faces there were in that particular village. But you know, and I know, and James knew, and it's something that is with us today, just as it was with us in his day, we are prone to make judgments about other people. And more often than not, we make them without knowing all the facts. Years ago, I used to work in a bakery. And I was in the management side. But there was one man who, on the shop floor who looked after all the machines and made sure they were properly cared for and greased, etc. But he had a very, very short temper. And people gave him a wide berth. But actually, he was an ill man. No one knew what he was struggling with. And so I think what James is saying here is so important for us today within the body of Christ. It's so important not to make hasty judgments about people and situations that perhaps we know little or nothing about. So whether it is discrimination, and that is a real problem in churches, favoritism, partiality, or judgmentalism, it's all with us today. And if we're not aware of these things, and if we're not aware of our tendency uh, towards these things, then they can lead to awful division within the life of the church. Now, St. James says there is an antidote to prejudice. And it is the royal law of love. Chapter 2, verse 8. You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the aim is obviously to serve all in meekness of spirit and humility of heart, as we heard from chapter 4, to treat others as you would wish to be treated yourselves. And therefore, this royal law of love, from Scripture, let us look for a moment and learn more about this royal law of love in greater detail. Let's see the all-embracing nature of God's love. First of all, let us look at the dimension of divine love. In John 3.16, a verse of Scripture that is indeed well known to all of us. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. God so loved the world that all, and sometimes when we read the scriptures, if you're like me, you can easily glance over that word all. Last uh, study, we looked at St. Paul saying that all things work together for good to those who love God. And when he, he says all, he's embracing the good times and the not so good, the times when we're hurting just as the times when we are rejoicing. All things work together for good. And here in John 3.16, we have that same truth being expounded. This love of God is for all. And as we embrace the dimensions of divine love, whether we find it easy or whether it's difficult, whether it's a problem or whatever the case may be, we can't skirt round it and ignore it. The royal law of love is a love for all. And that means the people we like and the people we don't like. It means the people we're close to and the people who we just meet occasionally. It means that within the family of, of God's church, being brothers and sisters in Christ, that love is to embrace all. And when we think of the dimensions of divine love, turning to Ephesians 3, we have these words. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. I find that very challenging. And of course, we see this lived out in the life of Jesus our Lord. We can see that he reached out to the rejected, the poor, the powerless, the dispossessed. He was to be found with publicans and sinners for which he was criticized. And if you think, and I'm sure you don't, but if you should think that in attempting to show this love to all that you will be free of criticism, you would be mistaken. Because it will be misinterpreted. He's only doing that for what he can get out of it, etc. But however that may be, the body of Christ, and the body of Christ in this place, building a community that will be part and parcel of the work of Christ in this place, we've got to see that this has to be part of our goal, that we will love as God has loved us in Christ. Sometimes, when I'm brave enough, I stand in front of a mirror. There are times when I don't particularly, uh, not all that fond of what I see. I mean, there was a time when I was a young man and I stood in front of a mirror and I used to look upon myself as being God's gift to women. <laughs> but those days are far gone. They're not there. 
any anymore. And, um, you know, there are, and I say to myself sometimes, George, who are you that God should love you so much that you, he gave his son, our dear Lord, who died on a cruel cross for me. Who am I? Do I deserve it? No. Because it was for while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't die for the so-called lovely. He died for us, warts and all, as Oliver Cromwell used to say. And so just reflect in this study for a moment. When you're tempted to discriminate against someone, when you're tempted to show favoritism, when you're tempted to be partial or to be judgmental, just ask yourself the question again. How blessed I am that my Lord should love me so much. And that is the dimension of divine love. We need to take it aboard. And we need to cherish it. We need to appreciate it. We need to acknowledge it. God loves us. <coughs> Irrespective of who we are or what we are. But when we consider the royal law of, of love, we also need to look for a moment at the description of divine living. How we go to live if this love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. In a moment, David's going to read to us from Romans 12, but before he does that, I just want us to look for a brief moment at 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 8, because there we have a pattern for divine living. Paul says, love is patient, love is kind, it is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never ends. And that is basically why the love of God, as it is proclaimed in the Scriptures, is relevant and important to every generation. There will never be a time when love becomes obsolete. And therefore, in our lives, reading 1 Corinthians 13, and all these things which love produces in our life, and, you know, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace. And as we walk in the light of the Holy Spirit's presence, then these things will become more and more evident in our lives. Now I'm going to ask David if he would come, please, and read Romans 12, 9 to 21. And if you have a Bible in front of you, open your Bible and listen to this, because this is a wonderful description of the outworking of God's love in the life of a believer. So Paul says, let love be genuine. 
Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient. In suffering, persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil with evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. No. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not overcome by evil, but overcome with good. This is the word of the Lord. So there we are. Isn't that challenging? Well, I hope you find it challenging because there we have the dimensions of divine love, the greatness of God's love for us. And then we have that description of divine living, how God wants us to live out the faith in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. And it is challenging because when we read passages like 1 Corinthians 13 or Romans 12, we're all conscious of how far short we fall of this standard. But that does not annul the truth. This is the standard. This is what God wants. This is the kind of church he wants to create. This is a people who will reflect his love. And you know, it's what the world is calling for uh, today. When people come into a church, if they do, and they do from time to time, who are, who are practically strangers, or they come in for a special service like a wedding, or maybe even a baptism, or whatever the case, or a funeral, they need to feel that love embracing them. And it's a ministry that we're all called to perform. Outside, they know all about the problems of life, the bitterness, and the, all the things that they are struggling with. They want something different. And we have that opportunity as the body of Christ in this place to embrace them with the same love that God has loved us. But finally, bringing this particular study to its conclusion, I want us to look at the discipline of divine loyalty. And I've turned to John chapter 21, and you remember, um, the verses 15 to 17, you remember the story of Peter and how Peter had denied his Lord. And when the Lord said to him, Peter, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know I love you. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. 
And some people have thought that by asking uh, Peter this question three times, it reflected the fact that he had denied the Lord three times. Well, that may be so. But it tells us this, that we cannot, we cannot live the love of God apart from a relationship with God. The royal law says you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And this is emphasized in the reading that we had from chapter 4, where we're told that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble, and where we're asked to humble ourselves before God. And if we do that, God will lift us up. To love the neighbor as oneself can only be understood when it is seen in the light of that supreme act of love, loving God with all. At one time, there was a lady who, on leaving the church, said to the vicar of that time, I resent being called a sinner when I come to church. I am a morally upright person. The minister paused for a moment and said to her, well, what is the first and great commandment? The lady knew her scriptures well, and she was well versed in the liturgy of our church. She said, the first and great commandment is to love God with all. So the minister said, well, can you honestly say that you've done this? And after a pause, she acknowledged No, she said, I can't honestly say that I've done that. So the minister said, well, if you have broken the first and great commandment, then you have committed the greatest sin. You see, people think about sin and stealing and murder and adultery all that kind of coveting, whatever. But in actual fact, when we come in and we sit down in this church, and we are asked to confess our sins, and sometimes within one's nature, and I've heard it said in the past, why do we always have to have a confession in a service? We need to have a confession in a service to remind us that we have all broken the greatest commandment of all because we have all failed to love God with all. When our Lord called you to follow him, he didn't promise you an easy life. He didn't promise his early followers in easy life. He said, if they've persecuted me, they will persecute you. And today, when we sit in this church under the canopy of God's love, perhaps we may feel condemnation. And, and that's the last thing that God wants you to feel. But what he wants you to feel is this. He wants you to acknowledge the greatness of his love, even although you're unworthy of it. He wants us to get a vision of the life that he would have us live for him. And he wants us to give our all to him. We'll still struggle with prejudice. I know we will, and I will. 
but it lifts my heart whenever I look at the wealth of scriptural teaching and I rejoice in a God who loved me, a God who gave his son for me while I was yet a sinner. At the end of that uh, note, it says, read again, James 4, 1 to 6. So I'll read it for you again. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it. So you commit murder and you covet something and cannot obtain it. So you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it is for nothing that Scripture says God yearns jealousy for the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives us all the more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And verse 10, humble yourself before the Lord, and he will exalt you. And this is the word of the Lord. And thanks thanks be, to be to God. Challenging stuff indeed. And certainly, I think if we spent time going through the notes and in the space, acknowledged in our hearts and maybe even wrote down, after all, no one else has to see your notes, um, how these things can affect you. And when I was listening to George, it reminded me of the Bishop of Swindon when he gave a talk to the curate I have, then, Helen. And Helen said that he said, we had to watch out for four things as ministers, all beginning with L. Lucre, money. Lust. Laziness. And loathing. And I can see how those fit in with what we have heard. So very often I remember when my first daughter was born and I asked the vicar to come round to um, talk about baptism. And then he came round and he spent his whole time summing up my little house. It was one of those Lego houses, you know, on an estate, very small. And we all had second-hand furniture. And I could see he'd made a judgment. So when he came to do the baptism, it lasted, wait for it, eight minutes. Because I wasn't worth giving time to. It was so obvious. And I never went there again. I wonder how easy it is that thing for lucre, for money. And so often the church is going on about money and wanting more money. The 
this church has got more money than a lot of parishes could dare to even think or hope of. And yet we worry about money. Partiality starts to take its toll. And then, you know, there's the loathing. How easy it is to turn from judgmentalism to loathing when we don't understand somebody's situation. And sometimes, I have to admit, it takes a lot of doing to keep going and try to understand where somebody is. There's that famous saying, don't judge somebody until you've walked in their shoes. A mile, two miles, ten miles. Because you don't really know what's affecting them until you get into their position, and their place. There's a lot here, a lot here that challenges me and I expect it challenges you because, like me, you're human. So I wonder, as we look at the questions, what is it about people that makes it difficult for you to associate with them? What things make you feel uncomfortable that perhaps needn't? do so, but you make that judgment. I remember my mother not being able to cope with anyone with long hair <laughs> when the 60s, when it started. She really, she'd cross the road, the other side, because she was so, well, very Victorian, let's put it that way. And uh, I wonder, even silly little things like that, can make us make judgments we shouldn't and make difficult. And I remember holding my breath when the best man of a couple came in with more metal than you could think or imagine in his face and tattoos and spiky hair that looked like a yard brush. <coughs> and I went, mm. and then I stopped and I thought, no, Vicky. And I talked to him, and he was absolutely lovely. And in the end, he, I, at the end of our rehearsal, I said, I'm dying to bless you because I want to fit your hair. <laughs> so he let me. He let me bless him. And it changed our relationship there and then. He expected to be rejected. Goodness me. What makes it difficult for you? Have you thought about it? There may be that you're aware of some issues that divide some people, but there are not a problem for you. What would that be? Of course, one of the issues currently under the spotlight in the Church of England is the problem, or the issue, if you like, of same-sex relationships. And we're doing a course, some of us, about human sexuality. But it's an issue that divides people quite strongly, just like women priests did all those years ago. Well, are they not a problem for you? But can you understand the other person's point of view? There are even issues in the church that occur. Don't like that song, don't like that worship, don't want happy clappy, don't want choral song. Different issues that can really divide a church. How are we going to deal with them? But surely it's got to be through the love that Jesus gives us understanding that we're all different and we all respond to God in different ways and need different ways of worship. What 
other issues can you think of? And what does it mean to look at people through the eyes of Christ? Imagine being able to do that. To really look at people and say, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Made in the image of God. That's what Mother Teresa did. How well are we doing looking at other people through the eyes of God? Looking for their heart and not their outward appearance. Not being offended by what they say and they do, but trying to understand and love them. Really challenging stuff. Perhaps this week you'll spend some time and be conscious when you've reacted, perhaps in a way that you shouldn't. But also give thanks for the people who've taken the time to understand you. Because for somebody, one of the, each one of us is awkward to deal with. So let's remember that. Shall we take time to pray? Father, we thank you for the challenges that we have heard today. But most of all, we want to thank you for your amazing love, unconditional, the height and the depth and the breadth we cannot actually see the full extent of your love or understand it. For your love is infinite. And ours is very limited. Lord, work in each one of our lives and in our church and together. Help us to love like you love, to be warm and welcoming, to be a place that is so different from the world that the light that shines from us draws others to be with us into your kingdom. And continue, Lord, to hold us in the palm of your hand. And when we fall, help us to, to stand up again, to admit it, and to move on once more in that wonderful, all-encompassing love. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer.